medical board certified pediatric psychiatrist here at the hospital. And also um, Sergeant Bill Burris, who is our representative from the St. Pete Police Department to join us up here as well. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, Michelle will be coming around to collect any index cards for, I'm going to get you my um, of any of the questions that you may have in advance. Also, inside your folders, you'll find a sheet of paper that allows you to sign up for any additional services or conversations you may wish to have. So at the end of today's event, if you would like to meet with a group on an additional day, on a Saturday, both for parents and for our, you our youth, please leave that sheet that's in your packet face down. And with enough interest to gauge that, we'll be able to contact you and get additional information out about following up. Thank you. So one of the concerns that I mentioned when I was first doing the welcome um, that I found myself is how much is too much? Um, I feel like they were getting inundated. On It was all over the news. It was all you saw all day long on TV. They're getting it at school, of course, social media. So where's the line between being there and talking to your children but also maybe giving them a break from it? Um, I have a... I think it's already on. Can you hear me? I think it's already on. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. I guess it stays red. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, we didn't we didn't realize that. Um, so I, I think that's a good question. Um, one one. One thing I'm thinking is by letting kids be in the lead, as I discussed earlier, and letting them ask the questions. Some kids you may find are just done. It might be too much information. When they're done asking questions, it's okay to tell them, I'm here for you. If you have any other questions, please come talk to me. And kind of let them approach you. But at the same time, you want to be looking for those signs, like um, lots of our speakers had mentioned today. If you feel like um, there's a change in their behavior, or um, you're more concerned about something, then definitely go back to them. But I think they're, they're, it, it can be kind of overwhelming for kids for parents to keep asking how they're feeling over and over and over. So again, um, just letting kids know that you're there and you're available and you want to talk with them and letting them come to you after your initial conversation is, is my advice. I would add to uh, Michelle to that question that we have to remember that you know, we're talking about an entire continuum of, of children and adolescents, those who are uh, currently psychologically unhealthy and those who have their psychological illnesses. And so that we as parents need to protect, especially those of our children and adolescents who already have diagnoses and may be treated, we have to protect them from repeated images. So the social media is covered with uh, personal phone videos taken of shooting events, et cetera, that just loop over and over and over. And as fascinating as that can be, especially to curious minds, it further traumatizes our children. So I think one of the other active roles parents take is to minimize access to media and social media events of repetitive, uh, redundant coverage that simply, frankly, increases the trauma. Any other questions from the audience? I've got a question from the audience. Um, this is about how can a parent help when they know the student is being bullied, but the administration doesn't act. So every state has laws around peer victimization and what schools have to do. In the state of Florida, every school district has to have a written policy about what they'll do if there's bullying, what the consequences will be, how they will offer help to both the victim and the bully. So knowing that and arming yourself with that information as a parent can benefit you. One thing that I recommend is making a request in writing of your child's school counselor or principal or both that they investigate the bullying incident. And this is not an, an aggressive thing to do. It's not going to be a, a you know, challenging um, worded letter. It's a letter that is just respectfully saying, I learned from my child that this happened. I'd really like it if you'd look into it and figure out um, you know, what's going on and how we can prevent future problems. 
After that, though, your work's not done, I would recommend that as a parent, you schedule a meeting with everybody at your child's school who might be important in this incident. That might be the teacher, it might be the lunch uh, lunchroom monitors, it might be the safety patrols outside of school in the beginning of school. We do know that bullying happens most frequently during unstructured school times, like recess and lunch, also during times of school transition, so like right as kids are transitioning into middle school, for example. So invite whoever needs to be there at that meeting and go to a meeting at your child's school to ask questions, to make specific requests of the school, perhaps. You want to leave that meeting with a written plan um, saying exactly what everybody's going to do. So I, as the parent, I'm going to um, seek out counseling for my child. The teacher is going to monitor the lunchroom interactions and kind of stand behind my child um, behind the lunchroom table to make sure that bullying's not happening during that time. Maybe the counselor is going to um, give some sort of a lesson to the whole class about what bullying is, what it isn't, and how we prevent it as a class. Different steps that everybody can take. Leave the meeting with that written plan and then follow a schedule up meeting about a month later just to make sure that things are being done. Um, among all the things you can do as a parent, getting the school involved is one of the most important because oftentimes that's where bullying is happening. And so the interventions really do need to be at the school uh, to keep victimization from becoming worse. Okay, I have to follow up on this because this incident happened recently at IMG, uh, or I'm not going to mention names, but a student was being bullied by his teammates and his parents did exactly what you said. They swooped in with documents, with all this legal jargon. A meeting was made with the head of school, disciplinary committee, all these people on board, and it didn't help the child at all. If anything, I think it probably, um, I, I don't know, created more isolation now and increased scrutiny from teammates, although no one was saying anything. So how do we, is that, is there another way that we can really more empower the child to go back to the setting and have these hard communications um, rather than maybe the parents' first thing to swoop in? And this was just a, I don't know, I don't know how long the history of, you know, in, the, in this question that had been going on with bullying, but maybe a first or second kind of time. Great questions, and, and kids are scared of this. A lot of times teenagers won't tell their parents they're being bullied specifically because they're worried about that. The problem is we spend a lot of time telling kids who are victimized what to do different, but most of the research is very clear that once you are a chronic victim, no matter what you do, there's very little you can do to break out of being a chronic victim in that classroom, in that school. And so some states actually have laws that permit parents to have their victimized child transferred into another classroom or another school. Um, I've met a lot of parents who feel very upset about that and feel like if my child's victimized, why, why should my child have to move? But it's because the research is very clear that that's a far better outcome for that victimized child than just moving the bully or just um, trying to tell the child to do something differently. Now all of that said, there are some pretty um, some, some pretty common deficits that kids who are victimized develop over time, in part because the things that are problems maybe made them more likely to be bullied, but also because when you're bullied, you tend to sort of isolate. You know, if you know somebody's going to be mean to you, you're not going to approach them nearly as frequently as you would otherwise. And so we see that a lot of times victims will have deficits in social skills. They'll also have deficits sometimes in coping skills. So in general, when something bad happens, you'll see that these might be the sort of kids who either pull everything inward and blame themselves or become very worried, or the opposite, or both. Um, so the opposite being where they'd fight back or they'd yell or they'd act out in class. It could be a combination of things as well. And so there are some coping skills types of uh, programs that can be helpful as well that usually as a parent you would access through a mental health professional. Now again, that's not a surefire way because once a child is victimized, there is that larger culture that's very difficult to break. That's why a lot of times we'll recommend transitioning into another class, but that those are steps that you can take. And then very quickly as a parent, I'll say the other thing you can do you can't necessarily affect 100% change in your child's school. It's sort of a very difficult part of being a parent is sitting with the discomfort of knowing that you can't fix it all the time. But what you can do is protect your child from some of the risks of negative psychological problems long term. So even if my child's going to be victimized, what can I do to prevent them from becoming adults who are depressed and anxious and don't go to college because they're scared? Um, and so some things that you can do, like we 
talked about, fostering best friendships is a big one. Helping your child develop mastery in something that they feel comfortable in that can be an outlet for them. Helping your child talk about things that are very difficult without swooping in and trying to fix it all the time. Um, as parents, we can tend to not sometimes feel very uncomfortable allowing our children to be sad or worried or cry. Those are very healthy things for children to do, especially in the context of being bullied. And so allowing your child to talk about those things without you as a parent jumping in and saying, oh, I'm going to fix this or you better wait and see what's going to happen tomorrow. Sometimes just letting the, your kids talk to you so you're a safe resource can be the answer as well. Great, thank you. Is there any follow-up or any other questions? Right here. Um, yeah, what, what do you think can be done to prevent or to reduce the times this happens or even prevent it from happening in the future? Yeah, can I start? Um, so I, I think, <laughs> yeah, that's the question, the elephant in the room question, isn't it? What do we do? You know, I think, honestly, we start, everybody starts from their, wherever they are with their own reflexive reactions. And so, so, you know, again, some people immediately launch into the gun issue and, and gun ownership, et cetera. Um, but by the same token, you know, we have to look at... <laughs> We have to look at the other dynamic, which is the vast majority of these incidents are committed by men, so hopefully we don't talk about banning men. But it's a very, right? No, I don't know. Um, you know, it's, it's a very complicated situation. We really need to take a look at this from a public policy standpoint. So we, we have our reflexive reactions, and those can be extremely uh, mobilizing. So, you know, we applaud the, the, the voice of not only agony but anger and desire for change and justice that occurs uh, after these events. But we also need to take a look from a public policy standpoint and look at all the contributors to these kind of violent incidents. Uh, we recognize that you know the United States is not unique. I, I, I think as a psychiatrist I would also like to say I, I think we have to be careful not to blame mental illness for every event like this because the reality is statistically under 10% of violent crimes are committed by people who have diagnosed mental illness. So most violent crimes are not committed by the mentally ill. So we need to be careful about stigmatizing the mentally ill and, and violent crimes. If you look at other societies and cultures that have the same rates of mental illness as we have in the US, they have remarkably lower rates of gun violence and death by homicide or suicide. So. What do we do? We start by reacting honestly as people have done in both, I think, personally and collectively, and we move to the broader issues of trying to uh, take a pause, take a breath, take a look at these things, and then activate research, gather the data. So much of the difficulty in addressing exactly your question has been that research isn't well funded in these areas. So you get small studies here and there, but we don't, we don't have funding for these kinds of things. And if we're looking at a public health issue like violence and death by violence, this needs to be research funded on a national scale that translates down into every community. You know, in the audience we have Dr. Berman, who's an infectious disease expert, and he knows probably better than most of us here about how you translate public health policy all the way down from you know, identifying the source of disease, identifying the vectors for transmission, identifying how to protect individuals and then communities from illness and how to react. So I think we have to look at all these various levels of, of the question, but I think what we have to do, and I think exactly what your question points to, we have to give voice in the ways that we are uniquely motivated and talented to do so, whether it's in social media, whether it's in organizing, whether it's in contacting our elected officials, whether it's in our academic pursuits and our professional pursuits, it has to go beyond just ourselves. That, that's my response. Okay, hang on a second. How old are you? 16. Okay. So, from a 16-year-old, um, did that really answer your question? <laughs> um, what else do you want to know? What about like peers? Do you wonder like what you and your friends or um, what each other can maybe do to minimize something like this in the future? Has that been anything that you guys have talked about? 
I mean, a lot of times it's kind of avoided in conversation just because no one really wants to say the wrong thing. But I mean, that's definitely something that gets thought about is like, personally, what can you do? Like, yeah. Okay. I can talk on that a little bit. And it's a very simple answer. Look out for each other. Right? So create that culture of support, of looking out for each other, speaking up, uh, reporting things. Right. Question in the back. So just, just to expand on that, I have a seventh grade girl. And we started noticing in fourth and fifth grade the queen bee wannabe type sort of syndrome. And what we struggle with as parents is getting the administration on board that A, this is happening, that we're seeing it, and B, how do we create a more inclusionary culture with our children when their environment is an establishment that they spend six to eight hours of their day and we're not there. So how do we get movement from our administration, from our teachers, from the other kids' parents to kind of go back to create a culture of inclusionariness, of cooperation, of you don't have to be my best friend, but I'm not going to turn my back on you. I'm going to include you instead of pick on you. And you being less than me isn't what I need for me to be more. How do we, how do we attack this? She's nodding. How do we attack this prior to it becoming to the point where we have children that are being victimized? And, and I understand we're not going to address all of it, but I think that for my child, the trouble that she had navigating started well before any, and she's not a and she's not a victim, but well before it would get to victim status or chronic victim status. And then, without that environment, how do we have children actually have their friends back without being worried about being the next victim? Or how do we have multiple children have somebody's back? The problem you're describing, it happens for boys and girls, but what you're describing is very much that relational victimization or what I call that mean girls effect. It is more common in girls than it is in boys, and it tends to get worse by the end of elementary school heading into middle school. The good news is that it does tend to decline in frequency by the end of high school, but those children who continue to be on the low end of the totem pole through high school are at risk. So you're very, you're very well justified to be concerned about this culture. I'll say bullying has happened forever. We are more worried about those kids who are chronically on the low end of the totem pole. Those are the, the 10 to 20 percent we're really worried about. Um, and there are a couple of things, sort of uh, several different aspects that I think um, we can look at when we're talking about this, this issue. One of them is sort of a, a culture and teaching our children this you before everyone else sort of thinking. And I don't mean, this is not a, a generational issue, it's more just helping our children and build that compassion, that empathy for other people. Um, emotion coaching your children. You know, when your children are seeing their siblings crying, for example, helping your children identify what's wrong with their sibling. How do you think they're feeling right now? Why are they feeling that way? Just helping your children build these sorts of skills is something you as a parent can do to help your child contribute positively and pro-socially to their social group. In terms of being a parent of a child who is in that position of being lower on the totem pole, chronically, um, never quite being queen bee, um, there are a couple things that I think are challenging. One is that when we look at relational bullying, it usually happens by friends. And so children, especially girls, oftentimes are scared to speak out, they're scared to change anything, they're scared to do anything, because they're they're concerned they're gonna lose their social circle if they do, and sometimes they're right. As a parent, things you can do, if your child trusts some of the, one of the other children in the social group, it would be reasonable for you as a parent to perhaps reach out to that other child's parent, explain what's going on, and get those friends to help. Get those friends, parents, to talk to their children, not with by, you know, about your child by name, if that's not the right thing to do in that social circle. You'll know that as mom, because you know your kid better than anybody does. Does, but perhaps having those friends' parents talk to those children about what it means to leave somebody out. What are things you can do whenever you see somebody being left out? And kind of getting those other children to help. 
From a teacher perspective, I'll say our, our teachers work hard, long days, and they, they do the best they can on a number of arenas. But as funding gets cut more and more, teachers find themselves in the position of being not just a teacher, but also a counselor, and also a, some, you know, sometimes doing some parenting work, being a disciplinarian. They have lots of different things they're balancing. Um, almost all the teachers I've ever worked with, they put their soul into being a teacher. And those who feel like victimization isn't happening in their classroom, it's often not because they're not looking for it, it's because they just really don't want to believe it's true. Um, unfortunately, we do know that children whose teachers deny risk in their own classroom have children in their classes who are at higher risk, so that's sort of an issue. Uh, I think that's sort of a larger um, educational issue for school districts more widely, but I don't think it's a teacher lack of effort issue. I think it really is more teachers not knowing perhaps exactly what to do, not having the resources to do it, um, schools having limited mental health types of services to help with these sorts of things. So I'm always very careful about blaming teachers and saying that they're responsible for the bullying because that's not always the case. It's very rarely the case, in fact. And from an administrative standpoint, um, creating school campuses that are safe and promote the well-being of students, we have to have that buy-in from administrators because that's where those educational, um, that's where the policies are going to come from for creating tolerance, for creating well-being, for you know doing the pro-social behavior, all that. And from the parent perspective too, modeling that for our children. And so when we do perhaps do a pro-social behavior or we're helping someone out articulating that and not just in terms of how that makes us feel, but also making sure that our child knows that that's because that's what makes maybe a better place. You don't know what kind of day that person had or how they might interpret what you've said or what just happened. But being there, talking through that thing, if someone reacts negatively to you, you know, helping children understand that we don't know what the rest of that person's life might look like and they're coming from a place where that life may look differently than what ours looks like. And I think this is the most difficult part, especially in the face of social media and the way that we present ourselves to the world on social media to such a larger circle than we've ever been able to before, rather than taking that moment to talk through that, what you've done and why you've done it. Even if it is something as small as you know a pass it along we do one positive thing for someone every day, whether it's picking up a piece of trash in the street or taking care of the person behind us in line at Dunkin' Donuts Coffee. You know, we're continually modeling that we're trying to put that positivity out there and helping someone else feel better about themselves. And we don't know how that might impact their life at a greater level. Thank you, there's a question here. I have a question that's also kind of what do we do, but a little different direction. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the solutions that's been posed out there has to do with making the schools more secure, either with teachers having guns as the extreme, but also just more security. Um, and, you know, I know with my children, they go to school and they have to, you know, the doors are locked and there's guards at the school. And so the question is um, sort of from a psychologist, psychiatrist perspective, but also uh, Sergeant Burroughs. Um, from your perspective, one, what are the effects on the school, on the children of having the security of, you know, what do we know um, from what these children go through, having to walk through a metal detector every day, having, you know, two or three, you know, officers at their school all the time. What is that doing to our children all the time? I mean, is it, maybe it's a benefit. Is it, is it letting them feel, or do they feel safer? Or do they feel more anxiety from all that? And then two, what is your experience is the actual benefit of having this increased security and having a officer presence at the school or even a weapon presence at the school? Like, do you, is there any suggestion or it just based on your experience that those things have a positive or negative effect? I think it's a balancing act when you talk about additional security in schools. Uh, not every school has an SRO on site. Um, some do, some don't. Um, you're going to have some students. What an SRO is? I'm sorry, school resource officer. Uh, you're going to have some students that uh, welcome the sight of police. It makes them feel better. It makes them feel safe. You're going to have some that maybe don't care to see a police officer there in uniform for security. Um, you could increase security 
if you wanted to, you could double the amount of officers. Obviously, there's um, you know funding, uh, manpower, or staffing, and uh, that that would uh, affect it. Um, to answer your question about arming teachers, I'll preface it by saying, uh, uh, by no means do I want to squash what maybe another jurisdiction says or what they would like to do. I'll give you my own personal perspective. I'm looking at it a little more deeply than uh, just the knee-jerk reaction of having a teacher with a gun, um, you know, for protection. I look at it a little further personally and say uh, there's, uh, it's ripe with problems. So you could do all the training that you want uh, and train that teacher to use the, the gun, but if they have it on campus, uh, I worry about the security of that weapon. I worry about will, if something does happen, will that teacher actually be able to react and will it be more of a danger to themselves or the students uh, or law enforcement that's responding. So I think it's a knee-jerk reaction to say we need to arm teachers. That's my personal opinion. And, and one more thing about that is uh, if you have a gun, we, we teach our kids don't touch guns, don't go near guns. If your parents own guns, don't even go near them. Don't talk about them, you know, be safe. But yet we're gonna have a teacher with a gun in a classroom and what if uh, the student who does might not have uh, good intentions gets a hold of that gun somehow. I, I, I don't think it's a good idea. So can I follow up there too? You know, because I get to sample these adolescents one by one all week long, and so I've I've asked Mike. You know, and, and the conversations obviously been coming up in clinic a lot in the last couple of weeks. So the overwhelming survey response in my clinic is teachers shouldn't have guns, <laughs> that it's hard for them to sometimes manage their classroom environment, and the students don't really want a teacher under stress, under duress, aiming guns. But I, but I, I, I resonate to your point, um, you know, your point about there may be cultures, there may be places in the country where the culture um, uh, and training, you know, maybe, certainly there are districts where teachers are carrying guns. And, and it's all about the deterrent value is what we keep hearing. But, you know, statistically, if you look at the studies, and there was a small study in, in Philadelphia that looked at if you were a, if you were a gun owner, uh, you were four times more likely of being the victim of a violent crime and if, you, if, if the gun owner defending their home pulled the gun, they were five times more likely to be killed in the course of defending their home. So, so there's, we, we have to, and it goes back to my previous comment, we need to know there are small studies on these things and we can give our own personal reactions. But we need to know what the data really looks like, and we have to develop that data. Now, on the other hand, you know, the deterrence value, I mean, there are a couple of studies that say about 3% of what could have been mass shootings were prevented by some armed civilian, some non-law enforcement officer uh, that helped prevent either some carnage or more carnage. But again, we don't have a lot of data on that. But yeah, my informal survey of a sample of 17 or so says, don't put guns in that teacher's hands. <laughs> to, to your point about, about the data and, and about not having the research, I can't remember exactly when it was. I think it was back in the 1980s. Our federal government made the choice to cut all funding for research on gun violence. And that's to me, is one of the things as a parent I can do is let my representatives know that I want research being done on gun violence because we're never going to figure this out there's, right now, there is no right or wrong answers of whether we should have guns, whether we shouldn't have guns. Until we gather the data, it, it's not going to work. So, in terms of bullying, um, I come I come at this from a somewhat of a unique uh, situation. I um, take care of a lot of kids with disabilities, and I've run um, um, clinic. Uh, amputee clinics where the child has a clear disability. And I, I unfortunately didn't have such wonderful psychologists as, as you guys, so I ended up having to counsel them myself. Uh, but lots of bullying going on because it's such an obvious thing. Um, I also am a 
parent of two kids with autism, and I've seen bullying going on there. Um, coming from a different state, I won't say which one it is because most people from Florida don't like this state, but uh, <laughs> um, I came from a state where uh, inclusion was, was really important. And um, my first six years of my kids, my kids are now 17, the first six years of their, li or of their high school or school, they were fully included, even though one of them is very involved. And I can tell you what I've seen, the difference here where they're not included. They're even, even in a regular school, they were segregated from the rest of the school. Uh, they had a much harder time. The kids, the, the, the kids, the regular kids in the school didn't understand. All they saw them was is they're abnormal. Where that first six years, by the end of that six years, every child in that school knew who they were. They protected them. They rewarded them whenever they did something good. They learned about what it was to have a disability. And, and I, I don't think it's a far stretch to say that, that being different, and, and that's oftentimes the reason kids are being bullied, is, is any different. If, if we do come together and get the, the schools to understand that they shouldn't let this happen, that they should uh, be supportive. I, I forget the term that you guys used in the positive supports. Uh, it makes a huge difference. And, and I'm not seeing that here in Florida, unfortunately. I feel like Florida is about uh, 50 years behind in a lot of the things that they do. So. Spoken like a Californian. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so there is good evidence that children being friends with other children who have disabilities, whether they're mental health difficulties or physical disabilities, that those children tend to have higher empathy long term. There's not good data to suggest that putting children into exclusionary, exclusionary classrooms where they're self-contained amongst themselves, themselves that, that that helps, helps although I think that's that's why those programs were developed initially. There was thought, I think, that putting children who have disabilities in a classroom by themselves will sort of level the playing field. But there's also not data to go the other way, to say that that's not a good thing. One of the because not a lot of people are doing that sort of research. Um, I will say one of the things that's always very important to me, um, I once had a, a very great mentor say to me, don't make decisions based on your bowels, meaning let's not make gut decisions, let's use data to make decisions. And so I can't speak specifically as to, you know, that it should be one way or the other. What I will say is the larger thing is making sure that teachers, whether they are special education teachers or mainstream classroom teachers, um, understand the risk of bullying and that bullying is almost certainly happening in their classrooms because it's just sort of such a typical pure phenomenon in elementary through high school. And we have time for about one or two more questions after this as well. Uh, Sergeant Burris, this question's uh, kind of directed to you. As we've talked about, mental health is a component of this and bullying is a component, but there's a lot more that is at stake and that is kind of um, bringing us to these situations, unfortunate as they may be. We, being a female and going through personal safety courses myself, um, am taught, have been taught to be aware of my surroundings, aware of the people around me, the looks, the actions, the behaviors, as in what that makes me feel like as far as my security. And where is the level that we can kind of bring that in for our children so that they know when something just doesn't feel right, to act on it. Because we're saying, tell them to report something. What do they know to report? They don't know, you know, you can look in someone's eyes and you're like, that person, there's something that I need to check on. As a, as a police officer with your training, you know to do that. How can we bring that into the education for our school, our kids, so that they know when it is worth checking out or avoiding or just removing themselves from? I can try to answer that. I think <laughs> that when you're talking about young people, uh, first of all, we're tied to our phones, so oftentimes these kids are distracted and they're really not paying attention to their surroundings. Um, it's just the, the way society is now. If, uh, and not to get off on a tangent, but if you go to any public place, uh, whether it be a restaurant or a mall, the majority of people are on their phones, and even people who are dining together are not talking because they're both on their phones. So I'm going to say 
they need to put the phones down a little bit so you can be more aware of the situation. Uh, as far as uh, having uh, kids, I can tell you I had a have a, a child who is 24, but uh, when they when he was younger, uh, of course we taught um, you know be when you, when you're going to your car et cetera after class. Uh, be aware of your surroundings. Well, what does that mean? Um, I think that you could make it really easy. And if your child uh, thinks that something is not right, don't dismiss it. Uh, listen to what they have to say. As far as what you're referring to, a reaction by them, um, the best uh, reaction that they can do initially is if someone is actually, let's say, following them or uh, they're suspicious of a person, um, the bad guy, so to speak, they're trying to be anonymous. Uh, they, I think once they're noticed, just a look by your child in their direction might alter that person, what they're doing, if it is suspicious or not. So the first reaction would be, I think, to uh, identify that person, maybe just look at them. Um, it's going to depend on your, your child and what the situation is if they take it further. Well, I think even in a school situation, if it is one of their classmates, that something is kind of just making them feel, I just don't feel comfortable around this person, but I can't say exactly what it is and trying to make that a welcoming environment so that they're just, I don't know, I think it's education on their part and kind of age level, it might be more a mental health question combined with that, but just knowing what is not right, because stranger danger is an old school thought. I mean, stranger danger is just something we <laughs> wish could go away because that's not really usually the truth. It's someone we know that's doing the harm, like, you know, most of the students were aware of the student in Parkland, and they knew that he was a problem and he was a danger. So what would have helped to, I don't know, that's kind of 2020. Huh? But, to, but to answer your question on that, I think that if, if your child is leery of someone at school, whether it be uh, just a gut feeling or something that they overheard, uh, the most important thing is, is communication, and that is tell somebody, whether it be a teacher or an administrator, they can, of course, remain anonymous and pass on the information. It may uh, help. Thank you. And thank you for that question, because really the key question is why do people not report this, these signs and symptoms of distressing behavior? As uh, she alluded to, there was plenty of signs of this guy from Parkland who um, was leaking information. And if we remember the famous social psychology uh, experiment back in the 60s of Kitty Genovese, right? And so the, in that classic study, um, this woman was sexually assaulted in front of her New York City apartment building with at least 50 neighbors who were watching and hearing this assault happen. And yet nobody, nobody called for help. And in fact, in the case, she left her home to run away and then came back and a second time the assailant still followed her and no one called to help with her screams and everything. And so something that we learned from this terrible exp ex experience was about this kind of, you know, distribution of, of, of information where people oftentimes don't report because they think someone else is going to do something, right? So everyone's looking, peering through the win window and assuming, well, so-and-so is going to call, so-and-so is going to call. So Maybe that's going on. What are some other reasons that maybe people don't report things? I, I have a quick question on follow-up, sorry. Uh, um, when a student is expelled for behavioral issues, um, uh, fights, and do, do, does the school typically inform the uh, authorities that, that that's happened? Because it seems to me that if they if the authorities were aware of it beforehand, there may be some intervention that happens beforehand. Um, I, I'll let you respond. To You're that. referring to law enforcement. Yes, law enforcement uh, or county I, mental health. Or I think that I think that in in most cases they would notify their campus police that the student was expelled. Um, I think that as far as law enforcement being notified, whatever local jurisdiction is there, it would depend on what else accompanied that. Uh, was there threat, were there threats made? Uh, was there some sort of crime committed by that person for the reason that they were expelled? Um, I think in that case, law enforcement would probably be notified or at least be aware. Okay, great, thank you. 
So Val, back to your question though, I mean silence, and as Dr. Faith was saying, silence is more the rule than the exception. I mean look at domestic violence. Domestic violence goes on with underreporting or non-reporting very, very often. And I think, you know, Dr. Faith uh, elucidated some of the reasons why children and adolescents don't talk about bullying because mostly it's among friends and what and all the consequences that occur. So as parents and as professionals, we have to talk about, we have to help immunize, if you will, our, our children um, against the th that code of silence that just perpetuates that system. Um, but it's, it's, I would say it's more endemic to human nature, if you will. We have time for one more question right over here. Hi, I'm from uh, Pinellas County Schools, and I just wanted to share with the room and hearing some of the things that we've heard. Um, we have actually recently partnered with the Sandy Hook Promise organization, and we have two programs that we're bringing into the school district. Um, one of them is called Start With Hello, and it's a program where, you know, you get to know your classmates, and the other, um, the other program, and I want to I wanna make sure I get this right, is um, the Say Something program. And so it basically looks at some of the warning signs and the symptoms and how to report. And another piece of the organization is actually an anonymous tip line, and it's an app that um, all of our students are going to have access to. So um, that's coming, and that actually started prior to um, everything that happened with Parkland. So we already have things in the works. Ah, one more in the back. <laughs> One of my son's teachers had assigned an assignment which was write a four paragraph paper about how you would prevent school shootings. So our whole weekend was, <laughs> I was looking forward to relaxing again, but it was around doing that. And then we arrived at his high school today and they had changed the entrance, barricaded it off, and had a whole new entrance um, with bookshelves. It was like going into um, the Room of Requirement in Harry Potter, you know, with <laughs> <laughs> crazy stuff in there. So it was a little anxiety provoking. I have to tell you that tonight really helped me, and I'm looking forward to going home and talking to him more because the first thing when I picked him up from school today was, why, why is that door like that? And, and he, is, he has medical issues and he has, um, mm -hmm. has some health needs. So I, it just, you know, made him a little bit more anxious as well. So I really thank you for tonight because it really helped me. Yeah. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for your participation. Um, thank you to our panel of experts. Um, Michelle, is there anything that you want to say to wrap up? Thank you all.